Пожандары? Okay. So today we'll talk about styles. What I mean about styles? Um, right now, here you have a possible implementation of the exercise that you just saw in the lab, now with the to-do list, with the new items, and so on. So that they appear and they may be deleted, and what you want. Um, it works, and it's ugly. So this basic HTML layout only with text and nothing more. Um, what we try to do today is to transform this interface into something more good looking like this one. So I'm not very good at graphics, but this can actually be done with, with, a, with a few statements. So w without changing the underlying functionality. So we won't need uh, practically to modify any, any statement, any, any Python statement. Hmm? So just uh, to um, exploit the styling capabilities of HTML. HTML uh, was born for text content. And uh, the HTML language should be used just to host the content of the page, the text, the semantic formatting, so what is a title, what is a list, what is a title, title, what's an image. But uh, uh, we should not use the HTML for doing the layout, uh, for setting the colors, the font size, the alignment, and so on. The first version of HTML had uh, additional tags and attributes for, for styling, but right now we want to separate it uh, completely. There is a, a totally different new language just for this purpose, uh, for styling uh, web pages. Hmm? Uh, this, link, this language is called CSS, stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And this language where we can define the style sheets, so a set of styles that are applied on top of our HTML page. So we will have uh, two different files, the HTML that has uh, the structure of the, of the page and the content. And uh, on a separate file, we'll have a set of rules, styles, that will apply and modify uh, the, uh, the, the appearance um, of the web page. So CSS is very uh, old, uh, uh, let's say, standard. It was born uh, just a few years after uh, HTML. And uh, um, it, it began to say, become really um, strong and widely used uh, around 2005, 2010, uh, combined with the increasing number of uh, mobile devices and other devices like, like that. Um, having a lot of different devices with different screen sizes, different uh, browsers, makes it very difficult uh, to have a static layout in mind. And so having a, a, a specialized layout language makes it very easy also to have different, uh, uh, let's say, style sheets for every kind of device. Mm -hmm. But so, uh, say, uh, by mo mobile uh, style sheets. But apart from that, what is the, the basic, uh, uh, say, rule, the basic, how it works, hmm? the basic functionality of a style sheet? A style sheet is uh, composed of a set of rules. So imagine one text file with many rules. Every rule is made of two parts, two components one selector and a set of declarations. The selector decides to which part of the HTML page this rule applies. So we have one very long HTML page, and we define a rule that applies only to a subset of elements inside that HTML page. The selector selects which part of the page is the target for this rule. 
and the declarations of the rule change and set some attributes to all the elements that match the selector. So actually, this rule says that uh, every H1 element, heading one element in the, HTML, in, the, in the page, whether there is one or two or 25 H1 elements, each one of them is targeted by this rule. Each one of them will have a blue color. So I'm changing the color of the text only for H1 elements. And the font size will be 12 pixels. So I'm changing some properties of a subset of HTML elements in the page. Thank you. Uh, these are style sheets. Then we have this cascading word. What does it mean? Well, uh, we, should, we should imagine the HTML text as a tree, not uh, as a text file. Right? Um, the HTML, an HTML page is made of an HTML element that contains a head and a body. The body can contain one or more, for example, division elements. Uh, and this div can contain a table. This table contains row, rows. Every row contains data, and so on. Uh, so we imagine the HTML as a tree, and not uh, just as a. Sorry, I didn't paste the text. And not just a, as a plain text. Uh, seeing the HTML as a, as a tree means that a rule that matches one element will also be inherited by the lower elements. So if, if I'm changing the color of this div element, the change will also apply to all the text that is included under this element tree. Hmm? So the, the rule actually cascades from upper nodes upper HTML nodes to lower nodes, and it applies to every element below. So with a very small set of rules, we can actually uh, describe uh, also complex mapping, mappings. Um, OK, for example, if I'm setting a rule for changing the text color on the body element of the page, then this rule will also apply to all the elements inside, so I don't need to change the, the color for H1, for P, for D. I, I'm doing that for body, and then it cascades to all the document, to all the elements that don't have a more specific rule applied to them. Because I could uh, specify a second rule, like one, like this one, that changes the text color to red this time, and I'm applying that to H1. So in that case, this red color will only apply to this node. And actually, you, you could see a conflict, you know, because there are two different rules that want to set the color on, the, on that H1 node. One is the more general one, applied to body and inherited by all the three. And another is more, a more specific one just, that just applies to all H1 nodes. Which one wins? Well, there is a set of, of rules, of priority rules, but, uh, and, and they are not, <laughs> not so simple. But uh, basically speaking, uh, the more specific rule mm, takes precedence over the more general rule. If two rules are at the same level of specificity, the later one wins over the, uh, the, um, the one that was declared before. Mm. So there are deterministic rules to say, uh, define an element and then redefine a subset more specific of that element and so on. Um, actually, we have a hierarchy of styles that can be applied in different parts. For example, browser styles. Every browser comes with a, with a predefined set of styles. If you, have, if you open a document with Firefox and then with the Internet Explorer, you find that the fonts are slightly different huh? because every browser def this, uh, defines their own default styles for the paragraph, default spacing, uh, the font for the titles, and so on. 
So they are coming as, say, initial set of styles. On top of this, uh, you could add, uh, usually, when you visit a web page, the author of that web page defined uh, some set of rules that apply to that page. Hmm? The author of a page will include the style sheet, and this style sheet will contain all the rules uh, that apply to those pages. These are the author styles. These styles applied by the author of the web uh, uh, site. And inside these author websites, uh, uh, author styles, uh, we have the, um, the rules that say that if rules have different specificity, so one on body and the other on H1, the more specific wins. If the rules have the same specificity, the later declared wins. So actually, it's quite reasonable. And uh, we can also finally modify the style of an element by adding some attribute on the HTML code itself. So usually these styles are on external files, are separate from the HTML, but then when I'm writing the HTML, I just need to add a style attribute, style equal, and I can apply some rules, CSS rules, just to that specific element. That will be called an inline style, a style declared inline inside the HTML, that takes precedence, precedence over the others. In the description, I skip the user styles because really nobody uses them. User styles is a, a set of style sheets that you can tell your browser to use. So a, a sort of changing the default style sheet of the browser with your personalizations, but then every web page will take the precedence over your preferences. So it are not very very much used. How, how can an author, the author of an HTML page, uh, include the style sheet into their page? The a style sheet looks like this. A file with the, an extension CSS made of a set of rules. Selector, rule, selector, rule, and so on. Uh, in this case, H1 is a font size, a, a font, uh, and the color, and H2 is different, and so on. Hmm? So in this file, we, we just have a long list uh, of uh, uh, CSS rules. We can, they can span on multiple lines because they are, we have these curly braces that bring them together. They cannot be nested, or just a long list. Hmm? In every HTML page on which you want to apply this set of rules, this style, you may include it with a link statement. So in the head portion of the web page, you add a link statement. The link with relationship of style sheet, file type CSS, include this file, href style.css. So whenever you want to include a style sheet in your page, you can just add this link element in the heading of the web page. And then the browser will load the HTML, will see the link, so we load the CSS file, and will process the CSS by applying different styles to your elements. Um, there are other ways, for example, for example, using a style element with the import statement or you can also have some CSS statement inside the page. So instead of linking an external file, you can put these declarations directly inside the HTML page. But I, I wouldn't recommend that because it's better to have them separated. Um, and finally, uh, we mentioned the inline styles huh, that are the application of a style attribute directly to the HTML element. So you can apply a, a, set, a rule just for to this uh, element. Okay, um, just to to see an example uh, on our application, uh, we know that this is being generated by an index.html template. Okay. How can we apply some styles? 
Well, we first need to create a static file with a CSS file inside. Size so style sheet. We can call it styles. And we can start, inside the CSS file, we can start defining rules. For example, we want all the text to be blue except for the title, and we want to make it red, just to make something very easy. Body, color, blue, semicolon, and then h1, color, green semicolon. So it's just a very minimal style sheet. Right now, nothing is changed yet on this page, if I reload it, because the style sheet is there, but it's not being linked in the template. I need to go to the index.html and add this link statement, uh, relationship style sheet, type text CSS, and address URL for it's a static file, oops, and then we close the link, okay, so static, and then styles.css. The usual way of including static files into the HTML templates. So if everything is right, when we reload this page, we get an exception, right? Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, File. What was the name? Sorry. Mm. Do you remember what to put in the static file? I do why. So just. Uh, By name, okay, sorry. Okay. No. Mm. Where is my browser? Here. Okay. So, this link of the static style.css file has changed the appearance of the text, except for the link text, uh, which has different attributes, huh? because the, the link, the, the color of a, of a visited link, the color of, not, of a non-visited link are different. But just to get you the idea, hmm? what can we change in the in the uh, in every HTML element? Well, we didn't uh, um, pay um, a lot of attention, but uh, every HTML element has really a long list of properties. And through CSS, we can change any of this. Now, properties related to colors, uh, to size, uh, animation, transformation, uh, the text, uh, the fonts, uh, and so on. So, for example, text uh, includes all the properties related to paragraph formatting. So alignment, spacing, uh, um, capitalization, and so on. Line breaks. Font relates to every character. So in font, you have the actual font face, the size, the color. Is everything inside font. You have everything 
related to borders. So the spacing, the boxing of the element, uh, drawing the borders, don't draw them. Uh, the backgrounds, for example, all these grays can be generated, and so on. So you can browse. There are hundreds of different attributes that apply to different HTML elements. So on some elements, some attribute makes sense. On some other elements, they don't make sense. But uh, uh, there are really a huge list of possibilities. And we can go there and, 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 and browse them. When you are on this page, you have the full list, so you can search what, you're, what you want to do. So um, we need to, to learn huh, the two portions of the languages. One, which are the attributes that we can modify hmm, here, all the properties that can be modified on every element, and how they work, and what's their effect. And the other, what are the rules? How can I, con how can I construct a selector? Right now, we're seeing just the simple, simplest case of a selector, which is called the element selector. I write body, it applies to the body element in HTML, the tag body. I write h1, it applies to every h1 tag, and so on. There are, and this is the simplest one, but also the less powerful, because it's not very specific. If I define the style of a P or a paragraph of text, well, in my page, I might have different paragraphs on different portions of the page, and I want them to be styled differently. That's why we have at least two different classes, two different groups of selectors. So we saw the, the element selector. In the CSS file, you just name an element, and then it will match every tag with that element name in the HTML. I write P, it will match all the P's. I write div, it will match all the divs, and so on. But then I can specify or group or specify a category, a class of elements to every element that I want in the HTML. So if I want one paragraph to be treated differently from a different paragraph, I could have assigned a different class to these two paragraphs. A class is just a name. I apply a class to any element. E stands for a generic any element in HTML. It can be applied to a P, to a div, to an image, to a link, to an input, to a form. And you just apply this label. It's called class. The only purpose of these classes are just to be, let's say, anchors for the CSS rules. When I define a class on the HTML, inside the HTML file, I can use a selector, which is dot class name. So in the CSS file, the dot means I want to match the class. I don't want to match the element, right? So I will match every element with this class. So in the HTML, I can tag the different elements. So for example, these are, these, imagine a blog. This is the post text. And these are the comment texts. So I want the comment text to be smaller. And the blog text, the post text, which is my text, to be bigger. So I will take the different paragraph, or maybe the div, the rectangles, including all the text, with different classes. Class equal to post, class equal to comment. And I will apply different rules with the dot post and dot comments that will apply different rules uh, to those set of paragraphs or divs uh, that may be everywhere in the page. A similar one is the attribute ID, which is matched by a CSS selector with hash number ID. So if I have a selector with a dot in the name, it will match the class attribute of any element. If I have a selector that starts with a hash sign, or number sign, call you as you like, it will match any element that has an attribute ID with the same name. They work in the same way. There is one difference, though. 
in HTML, the ID attribute must be unique in the page. So it's forbidden, it's an error, to have two different HTML elements in the same page with the same ID. ID stands for identification of an element. So when, 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 I, when, sorry, when I want to match one specific element and I know which one, it's better to give it an ID and match it by hash ID. If I want to select one group of elements that should be styled uh, consistently in the same way, it's better to give them a class, and the class name can be repeated many times in the page. It doesn't matter. And so that will match a set of rules. Okay? And we may have any combination of this. I can write uh, um, div.post, and it only matches the divs with class post, and so on. So I can combine these three basic selectors, and they also have a, a sort of a, of a grammar, a syntax, for combining these sort of selectors. So I can have one element, this is the element selector that you know, one element and another, uh, two selectors separated by a space, means only the elements of type F that are children of type E. So only the P that are inside the div with class post, for example. Or um, the element before, the element after a given one. I didn't want to get into details because we will learn a framework to write CSS much more quickly instead of writing the individual rules. But just to understand that this, it's a complex language, uh, CSS that can uh, give you sorry, uh, several uh, possibilities. And then there are some sort of, uh, I, I won't get into details, pseudo classes, which, are, which have a column syntax. Uh, say it's a link, A is an anchor. And I make a difference whether the link has already been visited or not and whether the mouse is currently over or not the link. So it can change the appearance of an element when the mouse passes over it. It's called the hovering, like an overcraft that goes on top of it without clicking. And so on. So the idea is, when I write an HTML page, be very careful about the structure. Try to add as much as possible semantic elements, not just a lot of uh, p, 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 and then change the style, but write, uh, use the addings, use divisions, and so on. Use a lot of divs for dividing different blocks, and maybe a lot of spans for, span is a sort of a, you know, div and span are HTML elements that do nothing by default. They are only used to draw a context. Divs are for different blocks of text or of content, and spans are for different segments of a sentence or are inside the paragraph. A div or a span doesn't do anything by its own. You can add as many as you want and try to segment the page in many different sections. Then you can apply a class to each of them, and you can apply, uh, when you have a class or an ID or both of them, then you can start defining rules. So the idea is try to structure the page well. Don't think at the colors yet. Think at a very easy to read and well structured uh, HTML with class names and ID names that are consistent through the different template pages so that when you have a, a class title, it would, be, it would be the same in, in every page, not change don't change the name of the classes through different pages. So that the same style will apply consistent, consistently across all the pages. And then you can start uh, uh, defining the, um, the different uh, uh, rules. For example, if you have uh, a list with the navigation elements, you can either tag the list with the main navigation ID, for example, or include it into a div with a specific ID or a specific class. That declares the purpose of that fragment of text. 
If I have in the same page another list that maybe it's part of, a, of the content, it doesn't need, the, it doesn't, I don't want it to be treated in the same way. The navigation elements should be maybe styled in horizontal with borders and with pop-ups or whatever, instead of a normal list that should just flow through the text. So I'm marking in some way, I'm highlighting a portion of the HTML text to be used by the CSS elements. I use div if I want to mark a portion of a text that contains one or more full lines. I use span if I want to mark a portion of a text which is a subset of a line of text. So span is always inside a line, div is always outside one or more lines. This is the only difference between the two. Div is called a block level element. Block stands for paragraph in HTML speak. And span is called an inline level element, inside the line. And so far, it's, it's easy to understand the CSS for changing colors, size, shape, and so on. It's more difficult to understand it when it comes to layout. So how can I use, for example, CSS to make a two-column text? or to make an element uh, move when I resize the window, and so get out of the way. So many of the properties that are defined in CSS are related to the so-called uh, box model. A box model is the algorithm that a browser uses to lay out the text. Every element, a single letter, a, sing a sentence, an input, an image, a link, a button, everything in HTML is inside a box, as its own box. And the layout algorithm has rules to uh, put the different boxes together, to join the different boxes together. So every element has its own content. It's easy to think it as an image. You have an image. Okay, this is the boundary of the real image, the content. Or maybe even just a single letter, the letter A. Given the font and the size, the letter A occupies some space. This is the content. If you have two images side by side, or two letters, usually they don't touch. There is a small space that separates the two. This space, so uh, a given content already has some internal spacing, just to give some air <laughs> to the element, to make it breathe. Hmm? This is called the padding. It's an uh, artificial extension of the size of the element. If the image finishes here, then I pad it a little bit, so I I make it uh, use a bit more space than is actually needed. Then I have another box surrounding the padding, which we call the border. The border is something to be drawn in a different color. The padding, as this uh, picture suggests, has the same background color as the real content. So the padding is invisible. It just occupies, by, occupies space by extending the background of the content. The border is something that is assumed to be visible. I draw a border, a black border, black thin border, or a blue thick border around the element. The border takes space, one, two, five pixels. And so it's, it's drawn here. Outside of the border, we also have a margin. The margin is the minimum distance between the, the end of the border of one box and the beginning of the border of the next box. So that the, if we have two elements, uh, the two boxes don't collide, the two, sorry, borders don't collide, by, but are separated by at least uh, this padding, this margin. Hmm? It gets a bit to, to get used to this model, 
um, you just imagine that for every content you have a padding that can be zero or not and then a border that can be zero or not and then a margin that can be zero or not and each of these elements padding border and margin can be controlled separately and on the four sides of the box can have a different value so you can combine all of this uh, to decide uh, how things uh, fit together if you open a web page uh, for example, the one with our, no, what is that here? With our to the list, and you open an inspector, the inspector will show you the, mo the box model of the elements. For example, you have this uh, new item. If you spec new item, it's a list item, li, element, and will tell you the size of the element, no padding, no border, no margin in this case. In this paragraph, if I select the paragraph, you see that I have a size of the element, no padding, no border, but I, I do have a margin before and after because a paragraph is separated by the next one by a slight margin. So every uh, HTML element ha already has their own set of uh, padding, border, and, uh, and margin instructions. Uh, the input here has a size, but also has a very thin padding. You see that the size of the element has some white border around it, so that the text you write within doesn't ever touch the borders of the box. And then you have the small border which is actually the, the frame around the text area, the text field. And it doesn't have any additional margin. So every element has these, these properties, and you can control all of them as you like. And by changing them, you can have different boxes join or, or, or be separated or have different colors, different effects. Um, OK, you have these properties that can control the different uh, aspects of every box. On top of that, so actually the different boxes fit together with a different spacing and different map margins. But you can also control the algorithm that the browser uses to position the different boxes. You have one normal algorithm. The normal algorithm says that Inline elements are laid out uh, from left to right uh, until you finish the window. Then you go on the next line and continue. Like words in a paragraph. Block elements, by default, are always one below the other. Different P paragraphs are always one below the other. The individual words or contents inside the paragraph are left to right positioned. This is the default. You can change that. You can change the algorithm by saying, OK, this div, which if it's a div, it should be below the previous element, floats to right. So it's not below, but on the, it's on the right of the previous element. Or as an absolute positioning. So it's always in the left corner of the page, on top left corner of the page. For example, like in the navigation bars, when you scroll the page, some elements are always there at the top. So they have an absolute position in the viewport, in the window. And so uh, if you change the flow of element, that element will be pulled out of the normal algorithm and will be positioned according to different other specifications. Um, OK, this is the normal algorithm. A box can be also hidden can display inline block or hidden or hide it. And the different box positioning algorithms, I, I won't go into details here because otherwise it would take two weeks. Um, it can have different types of uh, positioning, relative, absolute, fixed, uh, relevant to 
The fixed one is relevant, uh, the, you define the position with respect to the browser window. And in the other cases, you define the position compared to the container element. So if you have one div inside of the other div, you can decide the position of the inner one compared to the outer one. But I don't want to, as I say, to, to enter into details here, because we and the, another thing you can do with boxes is to float them. Float into the right. So if I have different boxes, one below the other with a normal flow algorithm, one of them I say float right. Float right. And so the floating element is usually none, don't float. If I set it to right, it will go to the right. And will be all the rest will be positioned normally, and then after I position the rest, I put the floats on top of it. I can also float it left, but in this case, I will position block two, block three, and then block one floated to the left, block one will cover block two in this case, so it's not a good choice. And if more than one box floats, okay, they are uh, positioned, all the floating elements are one after the other, and are shifted not to be. Uh, if you string the page, then they go to the next line. If there is not enough space, uh, they pile vertically instead of horizontally. These layout algorithms are really complicated. If you want to understand all the rules, uh, good luck. Uh, also because in different browsers, uh, they can behave a little differently. And we can, uh, the only, uh, the, the most useful information about floating is how to end it. Uh, you can have a clear, say, okay, if I have a, a paragraph with a clear property, say all the floating should be, co should be completed before I start. So all the floating elements should be positioned so that I, I'm sure not to have anything covering me. Hmm? But, these are, let's say, the, the basic construct, the basic property that we use to construct the pages. Uh, it's difficult. Hmm? And to make, or to really make a nice and complete and complex layout, well, you really need to understand all of these uh, uh, rules. We are lucky hmm, that the guys at Twitter already had this problem much before us. And they built a very powerful CSS framework. They call it Bootstrap, and they made it available for free. So Bootstrap is the CSS library used by Twitter. And it's very powerful because uh, it's a, it already has a lot of uh, predefined styles to be applied to our element. So we don't need a lot of work to choose the color, to choose the spacing. That will require also a designer uh, mind and designer eyes, uh, which I don't have. Uh, uh, so to select good combinations uh, and nice looking pages. So Bootstrap, so in some work, sets, sets a standard. Hmm? Good looking pages, nice looking pages, modern looking pages can be styled with a very minimal effort. Hmm? Just by using that set uh, of uh, a CSS. The idea is, of course, to exploit a lot of the CSS classes. So you design your HTML in a well-structured way, and then Bootstrap will give you a, a huge list of CSS rules that you can activate by adding the proper classes to your elements. And, uh, well, to activate Bootstrap, it's very easy because you just need to link the relevant style sheet, for example, from the Bootstrap uh, uh, website. So you can make a local copy and serve it from there in the static directory, or you can just have it downloaded directly by them, which probably is faster. Hmm? You can apply uh, the basic uh, Bootstrap, uh, uh, say, rules, and then op 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 optionally, you can also add uh, some themes that change additional styles in different ways, uh, or you can add uh, your own uh, um, styles hmm, to personalize it. 
So every page will include a set of CSS, starting from the general bootstrap one, then maybe a theme, then maybe a local one. And uh, by the way, bootstrap also needs some JavaScript support. It's mostly invisible to us, so we, we don't need to worry at the moment. And uh, uh, actually, this is the, uh, the bootstrap website. It gets a bit to, 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 to get used to that, but uh, then it's uh, quite easy. You can, well, it tells you how to download the files and so on, uh, but also gives you some examples. The, here is the normal look of elements under Bootstrap. So you have a navigation bar at the top, you may have buttons with different colors, uh, with nice shadings and rounded borders, uh, and so on. You, make, you can make tables very easily with nice spacing, with uh, alternated lines, backgrounds, and so on. Um, you can have these numbers. You can have drop-down menus. All of this is just uh, basic. Uh, CSS, basic HTML, plus the right classes in Bootstrap. For example, to make a warning box, if you go there, what you did is just to add the class alert warning. Alert, alert warning are two different classes. The documentation will tell you which classes to use. And the warning, alert warning, or automatically sets the color. The warning will be yellow. We are not deciding the color. Bootstrap is. Then if we want, we can, we can personalize it, we can change it. By, but by default, we already have something that is usable. So it's very useful for having something quickly available. A progress bar of different colors, and so on. Um, to understand how to use it, you should go the, the, the documentation is very complete, but it's not very easy to read. It's not very easy to find what you need. The, you can look at these two blocks, CSS and components, from the main page. CSS gives you the basic styles. So for example, if you want uh, to uh, define the styles for tables, you go into the tables section and will tell you that every table, if you want Bootstrap to change their styles, you apply a class table. And so it's transformed into that. If you want uh, the table to be striped with alternating colors, you add a table striped, striped class to the table one. So you, adding, you are adding different classes to have additional effects. If you have a table with borders, you can have a table border. If you want to have lines that highlight as you hover it on the, with the mouse, you add table hover and so on. So you have the example and the code for generating that. And if you want to highlight in different ways different lines, you can on the row, individual rows, or on the individual cell of the table, you can have add one of these classes, active, success, info, warning, danger. They will map to different colors. And then you have examples there. Uh, if you want to have a form with the input elements, the submit buttons, and so on, the checkboxes, you have some example, and you need to, to read it carefully on how to structure the HTML for the best result. Okay, usually if something gets ugly, it's because we didn't follow exactly the nesting of the elements, we didn't uh, use the, the right tag in the, in the right place. Hmm? But uh, typography lets you control the different fonts, uh, smaller, larger, and so on. And so you have all these uh, menus. One uh, important uh, Feature of a bootstrap is also the so-called grid system, when you may have stuff in different columns, and you just say, okay, you can, you uh, automatically you have the page divided in 11, sorry, 12 virtual columns, 
And you can say this element will occupy six of them, means half of, half of, the, of the space. Or four of them means one third of the space. Or eight and four, so you are dividing the, the horizontal space in two thirds and one third. We just this very simple call MD8, call MD4. You have different, two different divs. This is the second example. You have one row, one division, that contains two internal divisions with, that occupy eight columns of the grid and four columns of the grid. So all the rest, all the uh, layout engine float and all this stuff is handled automatically, invisibly for us. We just need how much space do we need uh, relative to, to the whole uh, page wide. Hmm? So that's very easy for us. And I say, one is the CSS menu, and other elements, other, let's say, customizations are under the components. Component is a combination of HTML and the CSS, so they are more, a bit more complex to use. For example, you have a lot of predefined icons. You have, uh, it's nice to know, this strange name Jumbotron is a big blocks, highlighted blocks, uh, that stands out from the page. So you, when you want to put a, a, an important message, you can include it. Instead of including it into a div and then changing the background and so on, you just include a jumbotron that makes it stand out in the page. Um, navigation bars. Uh, so how to make these navigation bars at the top uh, with, the, with buttons. And you see that these examples here are more complex because you need to combine the right styles and also the right structure of the HTML. But all the information you need is in these two links, CSS and uh, and uh, components. So how do we exploit it in our application? Ah, uh, by the way, the only thing that you need to remember is that all the content of your page must always be inside a div which is called container. So Bootstrap doesn't work from the body. It works uh, from a container down. You may also have more than one container, but if you, if you forget, if you forget to insert your content inside a container, div class container, it won't be styled correctly. It needs it for, for the margin, for the main margins, basically. So this is something that you should, you should, not, you should always remember. OK, these are just the screenshots from the website. OK, I said, how can we exploit this in our Flask application? It's even easier than, it's already easy because you just need to include Bootstrap. But it's even easier because there's already a Flask extension for doing that. So in the Flask presentation, we had, a, uh, where is that? OK. Uh, Flask itself may have uh, some extensions. Extensions are modifications of the, of the basic behavior of the Flask application. And in particular, there is one extension which is called Boost, Flask Bootstrap that already inserts for you uh, the, um, the link to the Bootstrap libraries uh, and already structures a template so that it's friendly for Bootstrap. Hmm? So it makes uh, the work easier for us. So you just need to install it as usually. The package is called Flask Bootstrap. And for using it, uh, it's very easy. Uh, you need to import Flask Bootstrap. And then after you create your application, you call the Bootstrap method, method with uh, the app uh, parameter. So this Bootstrap app takes your app and bootstraps it makes it uh, bootstrapified, hmm, if that's a word. And for the moment, app will understand bootstrap. In the templates, and we also uh, include all the libraries that are needed and so on. In the templates, in the Jinja templates, in the HTML templates, uh, you, instead of starting from HTML, blah, 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 and write your own HTML head and body and so on, you just need to include uh, these 
template with the extends instruction. Extends is the near return statement in HTML templates, in Jinja templates, and say, okay, this page will inherit the basic structure from the bootstrap base page. And you just need to specify the details. And the nice thing is that you don't need to write the page in order. You just need to fill different blocks. So this base page, base bootstrap page, defines a set of default blocks. And you just need to provide the content of the, of the blocks that you're interested in. For example, there's a title block, a navigation bar, a content block. So you don't need to write the full page, only the blocks that you need. Uh, for example, this is one, one example of a complete template. Extends, because you, we need uh, to inherit from the basic bootstrap page, and so include all the links uh, that are needed. For defining the title of the page, instead of writing the title tag, we just redefine the title block. So the block title is redefined in this way, and this is what goes in the title. The navigation bar can be empty by default. If I want a navigation bar, I can define the navigation bar. The content, I, can, I have a block that is called content, which maps to the real content of the page, and so on. I don't need to write uh, body slash body, HTML slash HTML. It's all already in the basic template, right? And these are, are the list uh, from the documentation of Flash Bootstrap of the blocks that are already predefined by the Bootstrap base uh, page. Mm -hmm. And those one, these in bold are the most used ones. The others are just for, let's say, uh, ad additional stuff. So, in practice, let's try to transform our, did I call it ugly, uh, application into a more ni a nicer one, or at least one which is styled with Bootstrap. What do we need to do? In the so you don't need this, you don't know this code, this is the solution that will be published for today's lab. But uh, we don't care, because actually we will not touch the Python code. Uh, just to show where is the difference. So we have a, a, um, any Flask application, which is created here. I need to make it available to Flask Bootstrap. So first of all, I need to import sorry let me do a, a very small thing to make it easier um, let me I just want to work in a branch so that it will be easier to merge it with the, with the main uh, solution. So let's uh, create a branch. Branches. Okay, I already prepared one. Okay, so I'm working this branch bootstrap layout. So I need to import, I already installed it before, from Flask Bootstrap, import the Bootstrap class. And then the only thing we need to do is to bootstrap the, our application. Bootstrap up. That's it. Nothing more usually needs to be done on the Python code. All the work, of course, Bootstrap is a front-end technology, the browser technology. Uh, all the work is on the templates. We need to modify our template. We don't need the style.css anymore. And we can work. Yes. And we can work within the templates. The template will be much simpler. 
If, if you go to the documentation for Flask Bootstrap, you have some examples here, which is basic usage. That tells you the minimal template for your page. So you can start. We can start from this. And we define, OK, we extend our template index.html from the Bootstrap base. We define the title. So the title before was here. I copy and paste it there in the block title. I don't have any navigation bar here because there's only one page in this. Uh, so I can make it or leave it empty. And then you have the main content of the page. The main content would be all of this, what before we had as a body. The content of the body is actually the content of the page. Then we need to change it a bit. but And we can throw everything away. OK? So. The title, navigation bar, we don't have any. The real content in the content block. We don't have any additional tag. Then first, first of all, the first rule of Bootstrap, always have your container. Hmm? Div, class, container. So that Bootstrap can work inside these elements. Did something change already? Let's try to reload this page. Yes, something already changed. All the fonts have been redefined, the title, and so on. It's cleaner than before. We can't go back. But remember how it was before. Like this, with these fonts and this spacing. Now, the new one is like this. We can do better. Hmm? We can, for example, style um, the form here. So we can learn how to style the form, how to style the list. Maybe you can transform this list into a table, hmm? this delete link into a button, something that looks like a button, and so on. So, and everything we need to do is here working in the template. So the first thing, the easier thing to do is let's try to transform this list into a table so that we can have all the delete uh, uh, links uh, vertically aligned. So it's no longer a UL, it's a table. And I want this table to be managed by Bootstrap. So I need to add a table class. And so it's not a list item, but it's a table row. Every line is a table row. And I need to add uh, to separate with a table, different table data, the description of the task, let me go into different lines, from the link called the delete. OK, so I transform the table, the list into a table. Here we have the four looping statement to create many elements of the list. Right now, it's creating many rows of the table. If I reload the page, there's something wrong, and for, and block. So I should have deleted some for. Oh, sorry, I deleted the for. OK. 
Hmm? It's somewhat nicer. This is a table managed by by um, Bootstrap. If you don't have it managed by Bootstrap, this will be the default look of a table. Maybe it's too large, so we want to make it more compact. So I don't remember. I go to Bootstrap, CSS, tables, and I see, oh, you do I want striped rows? Yes, it was a good idea. So I should have table striped and then uh, condensed, table condensed. Table striped, table condensed. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, it's so a stripes and it has, it has less uh, additional space. And uh, the size will adjust automatically you know, because Bootstrap is also thought for for mobile devices, and so it, all the CSS styles it applies are um, dynamically resizable. Hmm? Here you can see all the existing styles is very boring, so we can have a, like I said, a jumbotron to contain just one title, which is uh, your tasks. Usually, it's better. The fewer words you have on the page, the better it is. Hmm? So this, you have this big title, the delete buttons, and then you, we can work on the form for inserting your tasks. Hmm? It's not bad by itself, but it can be made better. So what are the instructions for Bootstrap Forms? We can go to Forms. And it tells you that uh, individual form console automatically receives some global styling. All input, text error, and select element with form control are set to white 100%, so usually they take the full width of the, of the page. And by default, wrapped labels and control in form group. This means that, look here, email address and password. We have one form group that contains the label, email address, and the input, the text. And this closes the form group. Then we have a second form group for the label and the input corresponding to the password field, and so on. So form group contains label and input. Another form group contains its, its own label and its own input, and so on. Hmm? For checkboxes, we don't want the checkbox to occupy 100% of the page, of course. And so we don't put it in, inside a form group. Look at the example. It has a class checkbox with the input type checkbox is the normal one. So we use a class of checkbox instead of a class of form control. So we need to restructure a little bit our code. We can choose a vertical layout for the form like this, email, password, check out, check, um, checkbox, and then submit button. Or if the form in particular is small, we can also use the inline layout, like this, from, from left to right on the same line. The difference is just, we just need to change the class of the form. Hmm? So the form inline in the form element, then everything is the same, form group, uh, Label, input, and so on. So, that, but the styles inside will be different. So, before we don't, we didn't have any class on the form. If you want it in line, we need to to put one. So, it's very easy also to experiment. You change one class, and everything else changes. 
So let's try to do that. Here is our form. So we need inside the form not to style it as a set of a paragraph, but a set of div. Div class form group. Group. And the form group, every form group will contain a label element that marks the text and the input element. The input element should be marked with class form control. And the same for the check, uh, okay, we are, we are only this one. The second one is a checkbox. So we style it as a class checkbox. With the input type and the tag, usually the tag is better to have it on the right. And we close the div. And finally, we have the submit button. So what is the example, the suggestion for the submit button? Button type equals submit class. And then we need to decide the style of the button. Class equal to button, BTN. And then the button styles. If I go to buttons, I see a lot of different styles. These are the default ones white, but if you want to change the color or the appearance of the button, you just need to change from button default to button primary, or success, or info, or warning, and so on, different classes. So in this case, what we can do to make it primary? So class equal to button, before all, and then button primary. So let's try to refresh. OK, this is the normal appearance of a normal form. If I want to make it in line, I should change the class to form. Oops. form in line. And if I reload it, instead of having wide input areas, I have a shorter one. And the enter button is blue. And what if I also, I also want the delete to be a button, instead of just a link? Well, Nothing can be easier. I can just find the code that generates the link. In this case, it's the A. And we can make it button. We can apply the class button to something that is not a button. It's just a link. But when I apply this class, it will be transformed. Button. Which, which style of button you want? Button default. And so a single link, a simple link, is transformed into a button. Looks like a, it's still a link, it's still an A link, but it's transformed into a button. OK, so you see, it still works. We didn't change a single line of Python, except from the bootstrap app at the beginning, remember. We only changed the template, by add, mostly by reorganizing the HTML code in a better way, in a more structured way, and adding the right classes in the right places. Huh? This is how, and it still works, of course. Hmm? Still works, and I can delete uh, this one, and it works. Huh? It's, it always updates. We can make everything into a button. So for example, one thing I, I did before, 
when I was trying this is uh, to to have, for example, this icon in the button, in the delete button, no? so that it's clear. So this is one of the components. So I, I don't just need to add some classes, but I need also to add some HTML properly formatted. If you see the documentation, it will tell you that it will tell you that you have you need to have one empty span containing these classes to generate the, the element. But I want the element to be inside the button. So I can have, for example, this is the link for the button. So before the delete string, I can add this new span, empty element with class. So the class is glyph icon. And then you will love the auto-completion of the classes. That uh, uh, What is the name of this one? Where are you? The beginning. This one. Copy. Paste. Oops. Paste. So it's quite strange because you have an empty block of text with two classes. You should do nothing. But actually, it adds one, one character. And since it is inside the A, it also, it's also part of the link, and it's also part of the button. Hmm? OK, so you can see that without a lot of effort, you can create nice looking pages with Bootstrap, Bootstrap Flask, and uh, by playing with the classes. This will be useful both for your websites uh, on the GitHub uh, pages. Now, if you want to change them, a lot of work can be done by, by tweaking the, the, um, the style sheets, uh, but also mainly for your application that will need to run to mobile phones and so, so you, you cannot use uh, very complex layouts. Uh, these ones are very simple and can also you know, be scaled automatically to different sizes. Hmm? So that was all for today, and we succeeded to make it nicer. The only thing we didn't make today, I leave it to you, is to change the color depending on whether a task is marked as urgent or not. You know, we can insert an urgent task or a normal task. I would like urgent tasks to come out colored in red, for example. So you can see the code and try to modify it. Thank you.